So, how many people have ever been in church before and wondered, where do I fit? Anybody ever have that feeling before? Anybody ever think, what's my part to play here? Um, I think that we've probably all been in that place before. Because let me just tell you, and I'll just start off with this. For those of you who don't know, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Amen. Christianity is God has called us, each one of us. And there's a calling on each of our lives to serve him in some capacity. And so because God has called each one of us, there's something for you to do in the kingdom of heaven. And there's something for you to do in God's church. And so I just encourage you, uh, there's going to be a wonderful message today. Um, here at Transformation Church, sometimes you have go to church on Mother's Day and you hear a message about mothers. Today, we're not going to hear a message about mothers. We're going to hear a message from a mother. Amen? Yeah, amen. <laughs> so we're going to do things a little bit differently here. But I just encourage you, I believe that if you pay attention and you listen carefully to what's being shared, that God will reveal to you a little about yourself and a little about where you might fit in the body of Christ. Amen? So let's praise God for Nancy Newberry. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, before I start with the message today, um, I want to share something about an exciting thing that happened with our kids. I was amazed to watch all of those kids thinking, oh God, you are really blessing us with so many children. Well, a couple of months ago, um, oh, well, let me start a little bit further back. When you give your tithes and offerings, you give 10% because you're saying, what I have comes from you, God, and we want to give back to you. And as a church, we feel the same way, that when you give your tithes and offerings, we want to say, this is God's money, and we honor him by giving it into other ministries. And we bless ministries around here, Teen Challenge, and Alpha Omega, and some other ones, but we also send funds around the world so that the gospel can go forth, as Jesus said, all around the world. Well, Dan and Fauna, who are in charge of children, are really excited about sharing with the children this call to missions, this call to take the gospel all over the world. And so, a couple of months ago, they gave each of the kids these little containers and said, put your spare change in here. And you can even ask your mom and dad and friends, put some spare change in here. And we described to them a people in Romania uh, called the Roma people. You may know them as gypsies. And they're kind of often outcasts in that in that society and so we shared with them and said you can really touch the lives of these families and kids if you'll get some money so after a couple of months of collecting the money they came up with three hundred and fifty dollars I want to tell you where that went. Um, Barnabas Ministries is a ministry that started locally um, Dan and Maria Hurlbrink um, their picture will come up here in a minute. Uh, Maria is a Romanian national, and Dan came from Clarion. He, um, uh, I got to know him as a young man, and he had such a heart and a passion. And they have been raising for 30 years. They've been pouring into children and youth ministry to raise up a godly generation in Romania. And they not only do it by teaching, but they actually adopted five orphans themselves <laughs> and um, are experiencing all of what that goes with that. And, um, but they also are a, a storehouse of things and they give it to the, the gypsy people around. And so they uh, took this $350 and they knew of a gypsy family. Oh, okay, so that's, they have a Christian camp where every summer they'd fill it with kids and share the gospel with them. <laughs> this is a little village of Laz. And um, so the, this is a family and this is a father and a mother. They have seven kids from 12 to one month old, and um, uh, one girl, six boys, and the father is, and the mother are both totally illiterate. They can't read, they can't write, they can't add. The father tries to take care of all of his children by just getting day jobs, cutting wood, carrying things, whatever he can find. And he spoke with Dan and Maria about their seven kids, and he said, my desire is that they should 
go to school. Well, in Romania, you can't go to school unless you have some money to get your own supplies. And he said, this family lives in a one-room house, about 10 by 14, and um, that's their home. And so all nine of them live in there, and they really wanted to build something. He said, I want to have a safe, healthy place for my kids. And they started to build, but of course they didn't have much to build. And so he said this money that the kids collected was going to help pay for the beams for the roof. Now here's the cool thing. He wrote about it in his newsletter and talked about what the kids here were doing. And when people read about it, they said, I want to give too. And so this $350 turned into over $3,000 that was given <laughs> to help bless this Romanian families. Which is how it works in the kingdom of God. So if you want to hear more about this wonderful ministry, um, wave Joe. Joe Hannah and his wife are out in a table over there. They're our board members um, with Barnabas Ministries. And so go over, talk to them, say hi, see if God put something on your heart too. Okay, so um, let's get started. On, um, we're going to talk today about the gifts of God. Paul talks um, in 1 Corinthians and he says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit who delivers, who distributes them. The spirit gives them these gifts for the common good. So I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts either. <laughs> All of you know that from the beginning of, God knew each of you before the earth was even created. And he created you special. And he gave you special gifts at birth. And you don't know exactly what to do with them until you actually enter the kingdom of God. And so Paul, in the, um, in the epistles that he wrote, he has three different lists of gifts. And each of them have seven parts to them. And um, the one we're gonna talk about today is the motivational gifts. Um, they come with you at birth and then they get redeemed as you enter the kingdom of God. The other two lists are gifts. God has more gifts he wants to give you. Some of these are office gifts, like the apostles and the teachers and the evangelists and the pastors. God gives you those gifts as you enter the kingdom of God to put you where he wants you to be. And then the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts, the, the healing gifts, the gifts of miracles, the um, discerning of spirits, uh, tongues and interpretation. All of these are special gifts that he still has yet for all of us to do. And he waits until you grow in maturity, till he's ready to give these to you. And then he says, I'm not taking them back. <laughs> so, so there's all these gifts, but what about the motivational gifts? Um, it's the Holy Spirit who gives them. So when Jesus left and he's leaving, he told his disciples, now just wait right here until I send the Holy Spirit because he'll teach you everything that you need to know about the kingdom of God. And so it's the Holy Spirit who puts us and knits us together with the special gift that he gave you from the beginning. Um, so just, so, he gave them not just for us to enjoy, and we get to enjoy this, the gifts, but the whole idea is he wants to knit us into a body, that we all need each other. We each need each other, and we see things in different ways. We see things through different glasses. Now, the only person who had all of these gifts was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he was the fullness of God, and so we'll see all of these gifts operating in Jesus Christ, but for us, we need each other and that's how God wanted it to be because we become the bride of Christ, we become the body of Jesus Christ. So I want to read to you from Romans um, chapter 12. He says, just as in one body there's many members and these members don't all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though we're many, we form one body and each member belongs to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace given each of us. And then he lists the gifts, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading or organizing, and showing mercy. And so today I'm gonna unpack, uh, unpack some of these gifts and I think you're gonna find yourself in at least one of these. Now, 
as I tell you what these motivational gifts are, you're gonna find this is really my strength, but that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to grow because as we also grow into the fullness of Christ, we are also to, to use all of these different gifts and augment the motivational gift that God gives us. Okay, so let's start off with a prophet. Now, this motivational gift of prophecy is a person who sees black and white. They say, this is right and this is wrong, and they're often very vocal about telling you that. <laughs> they're also a person who can look through and see deception, and they can see dishonesty. They just see it and they will tell you this. Um, they're quick to reveal their own faults as well because they can't stand the things that are wrong. Many people find this uh, personality of prophet, of the prophet to be kind of harsh, but God knows we need them. There's so many of us willing to work kind of in the gray, you know, and this person will say, no, this is right and this is wrong. So who's an example of this in the Bible? The apostle Peter is a good example. When Peter first meets the Lord, what does he do? He falls on his knees and says, oh Lord, go away from me, I am an evil man. He could easily see the evil in his life and he didn't like it. Um, as, as the ministry went on, he wants to know, okay, so these people are doing things that are wrong. And he says to Jesus, so, so how often do I have to forgive everybody? Seven times? Now you remember I told you that seven is the number of perfection. And Jesus says, oh no, not seven times. 70 times seven. <laughs> he says you just have to keep forgiving and giving grace to people. That's the way of the kingdom. So we watch Peter as he grows, and he's always the first one to speak and to speak up. So after Jesus leaves and he says, wait until the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes, on the day of Pentecost, what happens? Peter stands in front of this whole crowd of people who had come to the temple to worship, and they really didn't understand what happened to Jesus, how he died and rose again. And Peter stands up in front of all of them and he says, God answered all of the prophets. He sent his son. He sent the savior of the world, the Messiah you've been waiting for. And what did you guys do? You murdered him. You killed him. <laughs> and it cut to the heart of so many people that they fell on their knees and said, what can we do to be saved? This is the role of the prophet. As they expose sin, it drives people to the Lord Jesus. Um, another example of Peter being um, operating as a prophet is in, as the church started, so many people were so touched by what Jesus did that they began to sell their houses, sell their land, sell their cars. They didn't have cars, but they sold things and they gave it to the church and let the apostles give it to the poor so that everybody had enough. Well, there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira and um, they said, oh, look at everybody's doing this and this is such a cool thing why don't we sell our house? So everybody will think we're pretty cool Christians too. But what if uh, God didn't really come through for us? So we're gonna put some in the bank and we're gonna sell the house. And so one day Ananias comes up and he lays the money at Peter's feet and he says, we sold our house too and here's the money. And Peter looks at him and he could see right through the deception and he said, is that how much you sold the house for? Oh yeah, that's how much we sold. And Peter said, you are not lying to me, you are lying to the Holy Spirit and Ananias fell over dead. <laughs> and uh, a couple hours later, his wife comes in, and Peter says, Sapphira, uh, did you sell your house for this much and give this money? Oh yeah, that was how much. And he said, oh my goodness, the young men who just took your husband's body out are here too, and the saint, they're gonna carry you out as well. So there's kind of a harshness, but to God it's really important what's right and wrong, and that's the gift of prophecy. Now. I told you, get this from the beginning, and um, then you come into the kingdom of God, but we have to grow into our gifts. So sometimes the prophet, when he's immature, um, he not only exposes the sin, but he also exposes the sinner at the same time. And he can reject the sin, but he sometimes also gets confused and rejects the sinner as well and forgets to, that there needs to be restoration, that that's the whole purpose. Like on the day of Pentecost, he revealed the sin and then there was restoration. That's the purpose of the prophet. They can be very quick to judge. So did Jesus operate in this gifting of being a prophet? 
Well, remember when the Pharisees came and they looked really good. They were the holy people and everybody looked up to them and he looked at him and he said, you're a brood of vipers. <laughs> you are looking good on the outside, but inside your heart is black. Repent. He could see right through and that's the gift of the prophet. The next gift is the gift of the server and we are so blessed here at Transformation because we have many people here with the gift of serving. They are very quick to observe the physical needs around them. For instance, if I walk into the chapel here, I don't notice the stains on the floor or the frays in the carpet, but a servant goes, we need to fix that. Or everybody's hungry between, we need to make sure there's coffee and good things to eat. And, and um, or look at the grass, it's growing, I can help that. Or we need to um, build the um, gazebo over on the property. I can do that. I've got a Saturday, I've got a hammer and nails. There's all these, they, they just see it and they get great joy in serving. Are there some examples in the Bible of this? Well, Timothy was. One of the things the server likes to do is they recognize a man or a woman or, or a project from God and then they say, I can help, and that's what Timothy did. He was known as Paul's helper, and Paul often wrote to him and said, oh, Timothy, I need you. Would you bring my coat? Would you bring my library? Would you bring this and that? Because he knew he could trust in, in Timothy. Another one was Dorcas. As Paul went around preaching, one town he went into, all the women were weeping, and he said, what's going on? And they said, this woman Dorcas, oh, she died. She used to make all of the clothes for our kids. She could see things. She would make our clothes. She was just such a blessing to all of us, and now she's dead. And Paul said, okay, Lord Jesus, heal her, and she came back to life. <laughs> I mean, that was the way that God um, blessed her. And then uh, in the Bible, it also says that as Jesus walked with his disciples, that there were a group of women who followed them taking care of their needs. I mean, that's a true server. You only hear that in one or two little verses in the Bible. So I'm just gonna encourage you, there's a, a TV program out called The Chosen, and Paul and I have been getting so much of it. And one thing I hadn't thought about is, what did Jesus and his disciples do as they're walking? Um, it going from town to town? Where'd they stay? They didn't have motels and stuff like that. They certainly couldn't afford it. Well they probably camped out. And these women would cook their food over the campfire or take care of them, wash their, can you picture somebody washing Jesus' clothes? I mean, that's what a servant's heart is all about. So um, what about an immature server? Well, sometimes they can be a little pushy. They see it and they think everybody else should see it too. And when you don't see it, they're going, hey, we need help here. <laughs> I mean, get a move on it. And um, they're also very task oriented. We gotta get the dishes washed and we gotta do it now, or we gotta get the hedge done or pick up the garbage or whatever. And um, they forget that they're working with people and it's important to <laughs> treat people nicely. It's not just about the task. Um, Many times a servant will just pour and pour and pour into the church, but they forget to take care of their own family. And their wife or their husband's going, um, our dishes are still not done, or our grass is now 12 inches tall. Um, don't forget us as well. So as you grow in this serving, remember to take care of the people at home. And um, the other thing a server needs to do is to really listen to the Holy Spirit. Not every task is assigned to you. You'll see them all, but you only have to do some. So just think about if the prodigal son, when he's sitting in the pigsty, and he um, has squandered everything, and he's there, and God wants to speak to him and send him home to his father, if a server had come, they would have said, oh, look at you, come on home with me, I'll give you some good food, and I'll give you a nice coat, and you can get in the way of what God's doing if you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. So in all of these gifts, it's important that we listen. What about Jesus? Was he a server? Oh, yeah. Remember on, on the night before at the Last Supper, they were all at table, and all of the 12 disciples were saying, hey, before we eat, we need to wash our feet. Are you going to do it? No. You're going to do it? No. So what does Jesus do? He takes off his coat, he gets a towel, he ties it around, and he kneels down in front of each of the disciples and washes the mud and the poop and the sweat of the day off their feet. And he says, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will, because he's called us to serve each other. 
So that's the servant. What about the teacher? Now, the teacher is a person who reads every manual. <laughs> they, they have to make sure they have all their facts in order. They will uh, look at the Bible, and if, they, if there's a question up, they will research every line and everything that the Bible has to say about it. They'll go back to the original source. They'll make sure they have the facts. Um, line upon line, precept upon precept, this is how the teacher operates. Um, one of the biblical examples of this is Luke. When you read through his Gospels, you realize that he went back and talked to Mary and said, what was it like when Jesus was born? And he went and talked to all of the different people and talked to the soldiers and talked to people. And when he wrote it down, he had his facts straight. Um, I recently was reading and discovered that um, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts were probably put together as part of Paul's defense when he went before Caesar, and that so Luke really made sure that he had all of his facts right. Um, sometimes we can get a little annoyed with the teachers because when they're immature, they get all this knowledge and they go, I know better than you. I've studied this. You haven't studied as much as I have, and they can become prideful. So a teacher has to be careful in how he presents the information that he's given, but we need them so much. We need someone who's gonna check what's happening against the scripture. Um, a, a, a teacher can often trust his intellect more than the guiding of the Holy Spirit. It's really important for a teacher to sit and meditate on God's word and to get God's heart because you don't want to just have the facts, but you need to have the understanding of where the Spirit's going with that. Um, now, when you talk to a teacher, sometimes they want to give you way too many facts and you don't really want to listen to all of them because <laughs> they want to make sure that you know how they got where they're going. So um, when they're sharing that, and sometimes they can become argumentative. So if you have this gift of teaching, just learn and grow in grace. What about Jesus? Was he a teacher? Picture Jesus, he died. He was raised from the dead, and then he wanted to begin to reveal himself to his apostles. Well, two of them said, we've had it, we're leaving Jerusalem, we're gonna go to this little town called Emmaus, and they started walking out, and they're saying, what in the world happened? Jesus is dead, we don't know what's happened to him, and Jesus appears. Now, somehow they didn't recognize him, but he begins to walk alongside of them, and he says, hey guys, what you talking about? And they go, don't you know what happened to Jesus? We thought he was the Messiah, and they killed him, we don't know what's happened, and so it says, Jesus, opened up the Old Testament, and he went and he talked about every single scripture that referred to the Messiah and what should happen to him. That was a sermon I would have liked to have heard. He knew, as line by line it had been written, and he knew his, his uh, of course he wrote it, he's the word. So anyhow, okay. The next one is called an encourager or an exhorter. And this one is special to my heart because this is my gifting. <laughs> and um, so what an exhorter or an encourager can do is when they look at you in your messed up state, they go, oh, what a giant. <laughs> look at what that woman can do. Look at what this person can do through the power of Jesus Christ. And they don't see the mess of your life, but they see where you can go and what a blessing you can be in the kingdom of God. Um, they visualize spiritual achievements that you have yet to accomplish. One of the ways exhorters like to do this is by telling stories and um, showing examples. And um, they do that to get their point across. Now, in the process, um, oh, okay. And um, one of the other thing is that um, when something bad happens to a Christian, now Satan's always coming as our enemy, and um, he does things, but an exhorter knows that Satan has to pay you back for that, and that God is gonna use that to bring spiritual character to you. So if your house burns down, or you break a leg, or whatever, Satan steals from you, the exhorter goes, oh, what an opportunity. There's good stuff behind this, just go through it. And so they encourage you in that way. Um, an, an exhorter wants to see you face to face. They don't want to really talk on the telephone or type on Facebook or something because they need to see your whole body language, how you're receiving what they're doing. <laughs> um, so who is a good example of this? What's well, Paul. He had the 
office of an apostle, which meant he went around starting churches, but his heart was to see these baby churches grow. And so much of the epistles are him saying, okay, do this, stay away from this, grow. Here's, here's the gifts God wants to give you. And he was an ex a prime exhorter as he grew the church of Jesus Christ. Um, what about immature exhorters? Well, uh, sometimes we think that the story is a whole lot more important than getting the facts straight because it's such a good story. <laughs> and so we really need the prophets and the teachers to go, hey, wait a minute, um, l let's get these facts straight here. Um, another problem with an exhorter is because they love stories so much that if you share your story and they go, oh, attaboy, let me tell you what happened to so-and-so over there. Well, so-and-so hasn't given me permission to share that story, so they have to be careful to get permission to share the stories. Um, exhorters sometimes can see people as projects, and exhorters sometimes like to jump from one to the next to the next because their eyes are always going, woo, woo, look what's there. So exhorters also need to grow up. What about Jesus? Was he an exhorter? Well, think about how he collected the 12 apostles. These were working stiffs. I mean, they were fishermen. Some of them were soldiers. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them may have been carpenters that he met on the job. We don't know. But he looked at these men with all of their roughness and all of their toughness, and he said, these 12 men are going to change the world. Nobody else would have seen that in them. They would have just said, uh, they got blisters and their <laughs> rough talk, and they hadn't been to Hebrew school. I mean, they hadn't been he studied. But he said, these are the ones who are going to change the world. And that's what an exhorter does. They look at you and they say, what a gem. What a gem. Okay. Um, before I go any further, I just want to tell you that a lot of what I'm teaching you here today, I want to give credit where credit's due. Because in the 70s, there was a man named Bill Gothard who went around the, uh, the country teaching uh, pr the prince life, basic life principles. And Paul and I received the teaching from him that we have put together in our life over and over again. For instance, we have a daughter who's a has the gift of prophecy, and for her, things are black or white. <laughs> and we had to learn how to deal with that. For instance, um, uh, Bill Gothard was preaching that uh, only hymns were an acceptable way of worshiping Jesus, but we were part of a charismatic church, and we were praising with the best of them. And my daughter said, wait a minute, wait a minute, one has to be right and one has to be wrong. And so she had to grow in learning how, you know, sometimes, it's a matter of choice, not right or wrong. So once you know to look in your children and say, that's the gifting they have, we can work with that. We can help them to grow and develop that gift. And by the way, I'm a mother of four and a grandmother of seven, and um, my son is back there. He came as a mother, wave, Daniel. <laughs> that's <laughs> he came today as a Mother's Day gift for me. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the next one up is the giver. And um, this is a person who just delights to be able to give financially and other ways into the kingdom of God, but primarily it's financial. And um, this person would know how to obtain the resources that are necessary and then make wise investments in the kingdom. Uh, many times, a giver is a very successful business person. They know how to make money, and um, they know how to be shrewd in business, but when it comes time to give, they're incredibly generous givers. So over here, they look really tight, and then over here, <laughs> they're just really generous. But you don't have to be rich in order to be a giver. I have a friend, Libby, who uh, he doesn't have a lot of money, but over the years, people have discovered if they give something to him, he becomes a channel. And so he has warehouses full of construction material that people give him. And when there's a, a, somebody has a need, he just opens up the door and says, take what you need, it's all of God. And that's what it's like in the kingdom of God. So in all of these gifts, God pours into you so that you can pour out. And the cool thing is, the more you pour out, the more he can put in and somehow the warehouse gets bigger and bigger. Um, God's, God's uh, command to the giver is to be cheerful and um, organized. So one of our examples is the Macedonians. Um, these were ones, Paul had a 
a heart. Um, there was a lot of persecution in Jerusalem and they were starving and being thrown into prison and they were losing their houses. And Paul said, we really need, we Gentiles owe them because they've given us the Bible. So we need to collect money and take it as an offering to Jerusalem. And he especially commended the Macedonians because um, they set it up at the first of the month when they got their paycheck, they put stuff aside for this offering so that when Paul came, they'd have it all ready to give him and he would in turn take it to Jerusalem. And um, another one is um, when uh, Moses wanted to build the temple, he said, this is God's commandment. We gotta build the temple and the people in the wilderness dug into their tents and they gave so much that he, Moses finally had to say, enough, enough, we got enough. And as we move forward as Transformation Church to expand where God wants us to be, I believe there's gonna be this kind of plenty as we all learn how to give and to give of our resources and the stuff that we don't know. There's, there's blessings in giving. Um, one of the other people I want to take your attention to is Matthew. Now, Matthew was probably the richest of Jesus' disciples. He'd been a tax collector. He lived a really cushy life, and now he's one of Jesus' disciples. And he's the one who says, when you give, give in secret so that nobody's looking at you but, but recognizing Jesus. And he's also saying, do it generously, and that the love of money is the root of so much evil. And he had seen how money had been used wrongly. And so Matthew's a wonderful example of a giver. Okay, what about immature giving? Well, sometimes if a person has resources and they wanna give to the church or to whoever, an immature person might use it to control others and say, well, you know, if you do it my way, I got a whole lot of money to give you. And um, the giver has to learn to trust the leadership and to do what the Holy Spirit tells him. A giver, a wrong giver, an immature giver would say, I got stuff I want to give. <laughs> um, as Jesus said, don't stand on the corners and don't make a big show or blow trumpets when you give. Do it quietly takes a while to learn that. A giver could also have a tendency to hoard what God gives him, what God means for him to pass on as a, as a river to pass through. Um, the other thing is to be careful. Sometimes a giver is really tight and frugal at home, and while he's really generous in giving other people stuff, his family goes, I need a new dress. Um, the, our car's 10 years old and it's fallen apart. So the giver needs to learn how to be generous at home and not just in ministry situations. And here's one of the most important things a giver has to learn is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because there's people who in the quiet of their bedroom are kneeling at their bed saying, oh God, I've got a bill and if I don't pay it, my kids aren't gonna have a house. And God's nudging that giver and he's saying, go take that $1,000 and give it to this company. And the guy says, well, I'll just watch them for a while and see if they really need it. I don't know if they really need it or not. The giver needs to learn to be instant because then God gets incredible uh, um, praise and glory when, when somebody sees the instant answer to their prayers. Okay, what about Jesus? What did he do? Well, just remember when he fed the 5,000, he looked and said, okay, what do we have? We got these five little rolls and two fish and I got 5,000 plus people out here who are hungry. And he multiplied it and he gave and he, he took what he had and as he gave, it became more. Or um, one of the other things that I always find interesting is uh, at the uh, Last Supper, when Jesus knows he's going to be betrayed, he says to G Judas, go and do, he knows he's about to be betrayed, go and do what you have to do quickly. Well, the other apostles had no clue that he was gonna be the one who betrayed. And it says, since Judas held the money bags, they thought he, Jesus was telling him to go out and give to the poor. So that was Jesus's habit. As people would give towards his ministry, he gave alms to the poor. That's who he is, okay. Got two more to go. The next one is the organizer, the leader. They call it the leader because it doesn't translate really well, but it's really kind of a gift of organization. And my dear husband, Paul, has that gift. And so as I create chaos in our life, being an exhorter, 
He can walk through a room and put everything in order just by the time he walks through one. And something would take me four or five hours. He just has all organized. And um, so what the organizer does is he, he knows how to take all the efforts of all the other giftings and how to take all of the resources that have been poured in and use them toward goals. Now, he doesn't have to be the one who sets the goals, but once the goal is clearly there, he knows how to go towards that goal. And um, an organizer will wait until the people in charge say, okay, I recognize that gifting in you, go do it. And then they'll get it done. And um, an organizer knows who they can count on. They don't want like a mass cattle call with everybody to come and you have to organize this and that. He goes, I know I can trust that person who'll be here on Sunday and run the soundboard. I know I can trust this person to count the money and they'll do it right. They gather around them people who know how to do that. Um, they know how to break huge tasks into little manageable pieces and say, okay, you take care of that, you take care of that, and you can take care of that. Um, the organizer gets their joy in the completion of the task. <laughs> they see it done. They don't really need a lot of glory. They'll just sit in the background and do what they have to do, and the joy is seeing the goal accomplished. So is there an example in scripture of an organizer? I want you to remember Nehemiah. That's a little tiny book in the Old Testament. And so um, Israel had sinned. Jerusalem was in ruins. Everybody was taken away to Babylon, and it was time for them to come back. And uh, Nehemiah had a high position in Babylon, but he asked, to be sent, he asked them to send him back so he could rebuild the city. And he got there, and the walls, they were just a mess. And so he went out and looked it all over, and then he said, okay, you do from this gate to this corner, and you take it from this corner to this guy's house, and you take it from this corner to this. So he saw this total shambles with, oh my goodness, where do we start? And he organized all the people and gave them little bite-sized pieces. And in less than a year, they had rebuilt these incredible walls around Jerusalem because of the organizational skills of Nehemiah. So what about an immature um, organizer? Well, sometimes they get really frustrated at the inefficiencies of others. <laughs> and um, when they get really frustrated, sometimes they let you know about it and, some, and damage the relationships in that process. Um, and often they're so, uh, they so much want to get the task done that they will ignore the character flaws in other people, and so they don't help these people grow through it because they're getting the job done. And um, they also need to see the task completed or they become discont uh, discontented and could move on. What about Jesus? Was he an organizer? Well, look at, he took these 12 apostles and said, I need 12. I know where each of them should go. I know how to teach them, how to train them. He, and, uh, or look at when they fed the 5,000. He set all those people up in rows. He wanted to make sure everybody knew the counting because there was a prophetic uh, um, importance behind that. So he said, okay, everybody, I want rows of 100 here so we can count you all up and pass the baskets and stuff. Jesus was always organizing things. And of course, he organized our whole world and the universe that spins just the way it's supposed to. He's an organizer. Okay, so the last one is the mercy. And um, uh, this is the person who, when the baby bird falls out of the nest, has to say, oh, baby bird, we need to put you back in your nest. <laughs> they're, they're the ones who have such a heart of compassion. If you broke your arm or your foot, they're there saying, oh, I'm so sorry, that must hurt so much. Um, they share the pain. They carry it with you. They're really, really good listeners. And um, they not only share your pain, but they share your joy. They just carry the heart of the church, which is such a blessing. And they often think, since they're kind of quiet people, because they're such good listeners, that really, I, uh, I'm not very important in church. All I ever do is just sit there, and yet they're the love and the heart and the comfort and the arms and the hugs of the church. Um, they know how to bring comfort when comfort is needed. They want to remove the source of your pain. So if you tell them the pain that you're experiencing, they go, oh, well, if we just do this, it'll feel better. <laughs> we, we can fix this. And um, 
they thrive on physical closeness. They need to be close to people. They need to have relationships. They give warm fuzzies and they like to get warm fuzzies. So who's in a good example of this? It's the Apostle John. So the Apostle John, when he writes, he never talks about himself. Instead, he just says, I'm the apostle that Jesus loved. And Jesus recognized John's gift. And so every time something really important was happening in Jesus' life, he wanted John there to experience it with him. So think about the Mount of Transformation when Moses and Elijah come and tell Jesus about what he's about to face and his face glows. He wanted John there to be there and experience with him. Or uh, what about at the Last Supper? John wanted physical closeness. It actually says that John was leaning on Jesus' chest. I mean, this is almost un, uh, unheard of, but he needed that physical closeness, and I think Jesus loved it too. And uh, what about in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is facing his worst day of his life, knowing what's happening? He said, John, come and pray with me. And uh, from the cross, as Jesus is hanging there dying, he looks down at his mother, and he says, John, take care of her, because he knew that John would be the comforter that his mother needed at that time in the years to come. This is the privilege of the mercy. Uh, what about an immature mercy person? Well, so say a woman comes up, and I'm a mercy, and she starts telling me about what a rat her husband is, <laughs> and <laughs> he's done this and that and whatever. Well, a mercy can take on the offense without having heard the other side. And then they won't be able to look at that guy. I mean, they'll kind of glare at him when he walks in the room. <laughs> You're not meant to take up the offense. Your job is to bless and comfort and counsel that person, but not carry their offense because God's working in all of that. Um, a mercy can be real demanding in a friendship relationship. They just want you on the phone all the time. They need to tell you every piece of what's going on. They want to know all the pieces of your life. You're like, I'm busy. I don't have this. But a mercy needs that kind of love and companionship. That's what they thrive on. And so they need to learn to balance all of that. Um, one of the other things that an immature mercy has to watch out for is... Um, if there's a person and they're walking in sin, the mercy doesn't want to see them punished. They just like, it's okay, and they'll often gloss over major issues that God wants to work on because they're, they want that person to feel better, not necessarily to grow into all that God has for them. And the one more um, real important thing that a mercy has to watch out for is that the opposite of sex is really attracted to mercies ah, oh, that person's listening to me and they know, they feel my pain and they love me. And so a mercy has to be very careful to set up clear boundaries, not to get entangled because they can get entangled just as well as the other person can. And so you need to set guidelines like I'm not talking to somebody of the opposite sex alone. That will never happen. And, and um, uh no, we won't meet, and, you know, yes, have your spouse here or whatever. You need to set up those boundaries if you're a mercy. So, was Jesus a mercy? Oh, my goodness. He walked through and he saw all the pain of the people around him. And if somebody was sick, it says in compassion he healed them. Or what about us? He looked at our sinful state and he said, I can't leave them there. I will give my life so that you won't have to be separated from God because of his love. So let's kind of sum this up. And it says, um, even though we're one body in Christ, we need each, each other. And just like a body has many parts, all of the parts form one body. And so the Holy Spirit has chosen you to have this incredible rule that you get to do with joy. But it's not just for you. It's to build up the body. And, and Paul says, the foot can't say because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, or it couldn't stop being part of the body for that. And uh, the ear can't say because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, because we need each other. We really need to have all of these gifts working and operating in the body. And um, uh, Paul sums it up this way. He says, now look at everybody, the end of all things is near. Above all, we have to love each other deeply. 
understanding where each other come. It's, it's helped Paul and I so much in accepting other people to know that that's where they're coming from. That's where they're coming from. But that was how God wanted them to come. And it's made us much more tolerant and accepting um, and loving of others. So above all, love each other because love covers over a multitude of sins so that in all things God may be praised through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. That's just such a powerful teaching. And I, I hope that it, I mean, I, as I was sitting here in the early service, um, my eyes were definitely open to some new things. And um, I gained understanding through listening to this message. And I hope that you did as well. And I hope that we can go from this place and take some of the information that Nancy presented and apply that to our own lives. Not just walking out of here and be, being forgetful hearers, but actually taking the information that was shared and applying it to our own lives, applying it to our own situations. I love the idea of um, being tolerant with other people and seeing the different giftings upon their lives and knowing that just because they're different than us doesn't mean that they're wrong um, and that we can really come to love and appreciate other people for who God has made them to be and for the gifts that God has given into their lives because we need them and we all need one another as the body of Christ and so it's very important that we're able to recognize different people's giftings and be open to those gifts in our own lives because that's how the body grows together. Amen. And, and the goal there is, if you'll read Ephesians chapter four, is that we all come together in the fullness of Christ. And so when each member of the body is operating in the gifts that God has given them, we're all strengthened and we become stronger and we, we actually enter into a place where it talks about the fullness of Christ. And isn't that what we want to be together as the body of Christ? We want to operate in that fullness. Why? Because when people come through our doors, we want to be able to minister to them in such a way where they walk out of here feeling like Christ himself ministered to them. That's why we're called the body of Christ. Amen. And when each person is operating in their own giftings in these services, then people will come in and have that encounter and that experience that Jesus Christ himself ministered to them while they were here. And they'll walk out changed people. And that's what we desire. That's what we're looking for, that God would get all the glory for that. Amen. I also love the, the idea of um, Nancy shared about us being born with certain gifts that God has given us. And that until we come to know Jesus Christ and walk in that place of Christ, being Christians, those gifts are still there, but they just come out in different ways. And so even when we're Christians, sometimes we don't know where we fit. So I, I pray that some of the things that were shared here and that Nancy went through maybe kind of hit a chord with you and, and you kind of said, wow, that sounds like me, right? And so maybe that's a gift that God has given you in that particular area that he wants to use you in, in the church. And so really begin to seek God. And maybe you didn't get that revelation as you were sitting there, but God has a gift for you because as we said before, Christianity is not a spectator sport, amen? Christianity is something that we walk out each day of our lives and that God is, has a calling on each of our lives to step into. So I just encourage you as you go, from this place, this is my challenge for you, that you would pray and ask God to reveal to you where you fit, that you would pray and that you would ask God to reveal to you what his calling is upon your life, what the gift is that he has for you, because I believe that he wants to use you in that gifting to bless the rest of the body and beyond. Amen. And so a really cool thing that I was thinking about for those of us that don't know Christ, for those of us who have never been, as the Bible talks about, being born again or saved, right? You might have listened to this message and you might have seen yourself in this message somewhere. God created you with a purpose. Did you know that? Whether you've stepped into this Christian walk and this lifestyle and this journey or not, God has created you with a purpose, and God wants to use you in a mighty way. The first step in God using you in the very thing that he created you for is for you to surrender your own life and for you to say, Lord, I surrender myself. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And so I just want to right now, 
I'd like everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes, and search your hearts. And I just want you to ask, maybe you're here in this room, maybe you're listening online, but I believe that God is calling you today to take that step upon that path that he has purposed for your life. And so if you've never taken this step, if you've never surrendered your life to him and invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, I want you to take that step today. And I believe that God is calling you to take this step today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, searching your hearts, if this describes you right now, I just want you to lift up your hand right where you're at just between you and God and just saying, God, I'm that person and I want to take this step today. Is there anybody out there that would say that? Just lift up your hand right where you're at. Amen. Amen. If you're here in this room or you're listening online and you want to take this step, I want you to pray with me right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, I recognize the price that you paid for me on the cross at Calvary. Lord, right now, I understand that you have a purpose for my life. Lord, I surrender to your purpose right now. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. God, I completely surrender my entire life to you. And I ask you to give me the strength to live for you each and every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, I believe God did exactly what you asked him to do, and I believe that you've just stepped onto the path that God has planned for your life. You've come into the family of God today, and that's a special thing. The Bible tells us that all of heaven rejoices when one person makes that decision to follow Jesus Christ. And so congratulations in becoming part of the family of God today if you prayed that prayer. And we don't want you to, yeah, amen. Praise God. So this is a new thing for you. And so throughout the next days and weeks, I know that you're going to have some questions. Um, We just have a booklet that we'd like to put in your hand to answer some of those questions that you might have as you walk out your faith in Christ. And these booklets are right outside the door here. They are on the Welcome Center. And you're welcome to stop by, grab one of these booklets. They're free of charge. And I believe that they'll be a blessing to you and help you to answer some of those questions and help you to walk out your faith in the next days and weeks to come. If you're listening online, we'd like to also put this in your hands. So please just uh, put down in the comments section, if you just put free booklet down in the comments section, we'll get one of these sent out to you. And I believe it'll be a blessing to you. For the rest of us, let's just stand to our feet right now. If you could just lift your right hand, I just want to pray God's blessing over you. Father God, I thank you for every single person within the hearing of my voice right now. And I pray, Lord God, that your hand would be upon them in a powerful way. I pray, Lord God, that you would open up our eyes to see the calling and the purpose that you have for each of our lives. Lord, help us to see where we fit. And Lord God, what you're calling us to. Father, I pray that you would lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray that you would raise up each person within the hearing of my voice. And I pray that you would create them and cause them to be agents of change in the world around them. And I pray that you would open their eyes to the people that you've called them to and that you would show them their purpose in speaking to the people around them about the grace and the love and the power of God in their lives and that they might invite those around them to take that step as well. So Father God, bless your people as they go from this place fill their hearts and fill their mouths with your truth and use them mightily in the realms of influence that you've entrusted to them for your glory and for your honor and for your praise in Jesus' precious name. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Have an awesome week. Make sure, women, that you stop out in the cafe and get that uh, sweet treat out there for you guys. God bless you, and thanks for coming.